today's topic is going to be on boundaries, a uh, topic that I think we talk about a lot or we say we get boundaries or we need more boundaries or people are violating my boundaries or whatever it might be. Uh, and so I thought this would be an interesting topic. Uh, as a therapist who spends a lot of time with individuals, I've kind of picked topics that I've spent most of my time kind of repeating. And these are a lesson, so if you um, maybe you're unable to get into counseling because it's too long of a waiting list and you wanted some quick stuff and information from the counseling side of things, I hope that this information will be helpful to you. So at the end of your tables, uh, you'll see some pieces of paper. If you want to take a piece of paper and pass it down to, so everyone's got a piece. I don't know if everybody has a pen, or you need a pen or some kind of writing tool. What I'd like you to do, and we're going to come back to this activity here in a second. Uh, for those of you uh, that don't know me, I like to do lots of metaphors. I like to use pictures. I use whiteboard all the time. Uh, you may have noticed up here that I have some strange toys uh, that we're going to be using in a moment. But I wanted to just kind of do this exercise with you. I want you, and there's no right or wrong to this, this is just getting you kind of engaged with this information. I want you to draw a, a blueprint of a house. Like, it doesn't have to be your house, just a house. So I want you to be able to draw kind of what you're, if you're in a helicopter or you're on Google Earth, that would be a better idea, right? You go down, there's your, your property and your house, and if you could cut the top off your house and just kind of look into it like a box, um, you know, have some rooms in there so you can see where the walls are. You know what I'm saying? That blueprint's not quite the word, but that idea. So this Google Earth. So I want you to draw. It does not, you don't have to have an artist rendition. It just, you just have to know that this looks vaguely like some kind of house. You don't have to have a house for 500 people. Just a basic kind of nuts and bolts of, of what a house looks like. And while you're doing that, um, we're going to also do this little exercise. Um, kind of at the same time. So I'm going to kind of let you draw that for a second. But one of the things I have up here is a castle. And because you can't all see the castle, I took pictures of it so that you can see it on the screen. But this is actually something that, uh, that I built because um, I like to build stuff and, and tinker with ideas. After talking with a client several years ago about this idea of of boundaries. And this person, when they came in, was, was talking about how I just, I'm not sure how to keep people where they need to be, and I feel like life's caving in on me. And so we began this discussion about castles and building a castle, and, um, and she felt like she had a fairly good castle, and as we started to talk about it, it seemed like her castle was missing some, some pieces. And that her castle and her, her place, her house, didn't really qu quite feel uh, uh, safe. So one of the other things that I have um, in my counseling practice, I do a, a process called sand tray therapy. Sand tray therapy comes out of trauma work. Uh, so I actually have about 500 figurines, of which I bought a few today because I use figurines for doing this kind of thing, because a picture paints a thousand words. So, so up on the screens there, I have taken a photo of the various little toys that I have. Now, my toy collection is now in Lindsay's office. If you ever go into the counseling office and you see all these toys and you think, man, you guys are crazy collectors, right? Uh, these are actually tools of the trade. Uh, this is a process we call in counseling to be able to externalize something that we can't put into words. In fact, many times, if you have your brain and we use a little model like this in your hands, the right side of your brain is the creative side, the part that you're using right now to draw your picture of your house. And the left side of your brain is your analytical side of the brain. Now, in a very simplistic way, I like to show it like this. The right side of your brain has a picture, a movie going on of life, right? And the left side of your brain talks about what's going on in the movie. So when you were talking to someone about going to Todd Talks today, you had this, this movie of Todd Talks from last week, if you came, you knew what it was like. And then you told a friend about it, and this is how your brain was sort of working, a very simplistic way. In trauma, though, this stops working. We can't actually put into words what we're thinking and sometimes what we're feeling. But there's definitely a movie that's going on and on and on. Last week, we talked about uh, accusatory thought voices and this idea that I have this negative thought and it just goes over and over and over. And I, I keep thinking about that. And I'm thinking that the deceptive lie means I'm going to fail and I'm not going to make it. And it's like this picture that goes around. But sometimes we can't even explain what's going on. 
So sand tray therapy and the toys are a way of what we call externalizing the process. If I could show you what I was thinking or feeling, then maybe we could talk about it. And it, maybe it would make more sense. And maybe I could make adjustments. So that's why we have these weird toys. Not everyone uses this technique. I particularly like it because I'm a metaphor guy, so it's really helpful. So I have these toys up here. You'll notice uh, on the screen we've got, we've got Olaf and we've got some little uh, knights. Um, you know, these little guys here. We've got some scared people. Of course, we've got Disgust. This was the best movie ever made for therapists, right? Because now we had all these little toys that actually had the emotions. Those are really cool, right? So we've got Disgust and uh, we've got dragons and, and warriors and different things. And I have Athena here, who's our female warrior. Women with weapons is really hard to find, if you ever notice that, right? It's just my thing. So if you ever find a, a girl with a sword, a shield, or just anything that looks like super awesome, you should buy it because they're rare. So anyway, so we've got a girl there, okay? So why am I showing you all these toys and what about this castle? Hopefully you guys are done drawing your basic diagram of your house because we're going to come back to that. Here's my castle. Now, uh, we're going to choose... Um, we're going to choose, so I've got a, I've got, a, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be gender specific, right? So I've got a, I've got a little blue guy here who's super scared. He's, a, he's up there. Yeah, he's up there. He's in front of Cinderella. And, and then this, this girl that's kind of scared, right? The B-52, B, B, B horror film guys, not the B-52s, they're a band. All right, so I'm going to put these guys inside my castle, which you won't be able to see, but you've now seen them, so you know they're in there, and they're kind of scared. So you've got to have this picture in your head of scared, right? So now, this is like a little class participation time. Here's this great castle, right? A place of, of salvation, a place of protection, right? But as you look at this castle, right, what, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with that picture? Small? There's no door. Right? So this castle, while it has some nice walls, is really uh, not re that safe. Right? You just walk in the front, front door. So one of the nice things about the way this is built, because this is my boundaries castle, I actually have a door here. Right? So now we can put a door on here. So we're going to stick our door on the front. Now as you see that door go on, does the castle feel safer? Yes or no? Yes, right? The power of suggestion, right? And toys. Yes, feel safer. Now, if you were in this castle, it would be safe. Could you think of ways, go back medieval now, <laughs> that you could make it even safer still? A moat, right? Heard a moat, right? We happen to have a moat. Looks like this. We're going to put our moat on here, right? It just sits right on there. Okay, I don't know if you can quite see that. I got, a, I got another picture of this up close. Let's jump through. Uh, let, let me show you these figures first, right? So there's this close up of all of those people. Then we got these guys, right? Then these are the bad guys, right? But anyway, here's the, here's the picture of the castle with the moat around it, okay? So that's kind of nice. Now, the nice thing about the moat is that the door can come down. If you want the door to come down, you can let people in and you can, you can close it. What other things? Is this safer than it was before? Yes. yes. Uh, is there something else that we could do? Guards. So we can find some guards, right? So we have some guards. So I have these two little guards. We put them up here. They can be watching, okay? Make sure no one's coming. Now, had we brought these guys out at the beginning, right? These are, this is my dragon, right? I always feel like this is my revelation dragon, right? This is the most expensive toy in my collection, and I walked around the toy store for about an hour before I actually parted with the money to buy it because I just couldn't justify or tell my wife that I just <laughs> spent the money on a silly toy like that, right? Yeah, so here's our dragon, right? So that makes it kind of a little scarier. Now, there's other things that we might have in our world, right? Who are, who are these people, maybe? Civilians. Civilians, peasants, right? And sometimes they might be outside because we didn't know we were getting the moat and we didn't know we were getting the door, and it all kind of happened very quickly, right? Sometimes you might think of these like Noah and Noah's Ark, right? Suddenly the rain came, now I'm really stressed out, and you're outside of the Ark and, and this kind of problems, right? So you got that, okay? Um, 
Now, there's other things inside here, okay? We've got some, these little scared people. This is, this is kind of one way of existing. This might be another way of existing, right? Kind of which person are we going to be? Which one feels safer? The one with the shield, right? So we've got a shield. We've got this weird axe knife looking thing. She's got a helmet. She's got all kinds of gear on, right? Now we've also got this guy. If you're a guy, this is Hercules, right? He's got a lion. He's got a lion on his, on his head. So he's like, he's done this before. Where is he? There he is. Okay. All right. He's ripped. He's got a club, right? Now, if we put these guys in here, well, I lost my god. You can't see it, right? Where you put her up here. Oh, everyone's sliding. It helps if you make noises to play with your toys. No, come back. Oh, you're going to die. Ah. Come on, sit in there, Athena. There you go. Okay? Now we've got this building that's a little bit more secure, right? Now, watch this. The door, you can, you can make the door. It'll still come down. Like, you can still get in there. How do you get the door to come down? Chains, but like how, how, in real life, how would you get the door to come down? Order someone to do it. Maybe you ask, right? These people, hey, 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 there's a big dragon out here. Let me in. No, we're not letting you in, right? Whatever it is. You're going to be super needy, and you're going to eat all that food. We don't want you in here, right? I don't know what it is, okay? But this is this, is this process about boundaries, right? Some people in our boundary discussion, I like, and I couldn't find this, and I got a couple of clips because you got to have clips of things, right? I was looking for AFV, Funniest Home Videos, because I had, there had to be one, and there's probably one out there. But when I had my kids and we went to jumpy houses, do you remember jumpy houses? This is a fun thing that I like to do as a dad. And, and they'd get, they're little, so they'd get into this jumpy house, they'd jump up there, and I'd say, come, come here, come here, come here, I want to tell you something. And they'd come over, and they'd lean on the thing, and they'd lean in real quick, come here, come here. And then I'd just push the wall, like, as hard as I could. And then, woof, and they go flying back, bounce, bounce, ha, 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 ha. And then they do it again, right? And this is what we do all day long. And what makes that a, a kind of weirdly funny for kids is that there's a wall here that doesn't function like a wall, right? The wall is supposed to stay still. The wall is, it comes in at 100 miles an hour, right? And it's hilarious. And we can do it over and over again. That's what makes jumpy castles so much fun. They defy the rules of a building, right? Sometimes people that have good boundaries, their boundaries are like those jumpy houses. Their walls and their, their things that are supposed to stay where they're supposed to stay actually go in and out, which actually makes it very unsafe. Right? I go up to a wall thinking that I'm going to be okay, and suddenly the wall comes in at 100 miles an hour, and I fall on my butt and get hurt. Right? Or that I accuse the person outside of there of being mean right? when they thought it was all fun, because that's the best part about being a dad is to knock your kids over and jump your house. Right? I don't see what your problem is, because you're violating my boundaries, Dad. No, I'm not. You just need to get over it. Right? But this is kind of these walls. right? This is this process. Boundaries are kind of everywhere. Now, you guys might have a picture like mine here, okay? So this is another illustration that I will sometimes do. Now, let me, you don't have to answer this, but I'm going to point out some stuff. Now, I, act, I know where we're going, so it's, I have cheap answers, right? But I designed my house here. You'll notice that I have this big perimeter around my house, a big fence. Now, my actual house where I live, and I live out in the country with my animals, we don't actually have a fence at all. There is no fence. But it also means that my neighbors will walk up onto my back porch while I'm making dinner, and they're just there. It's like, well, hello, you know. They're just coming in, and that's fine, um, because that's how it is. But it, when I lived in Robbinsdale on my postage stamp, we had a fence. In fact, when our neighbors put in their fence, I was almost like a little bit annoyed. Like, why do we have to put in a fence, right? This is like separating us. I don't know how I feel about that. But there's a gate, right? And we have a yard. And then and in my house here, I've got kind of like a porch. I don't know what you, did you call a porch. Yeah, we call them a veranda. But, you know, verandas go all the way around the house over here, right? So anyway, you got like a porch or something. And that's where the door is. And then i got a kitchen. Right? You come into the kitchen, and there's a dining room and a living room and a bedroom. And I don't know what you have on your house and how your floor plan's set up. 
But let's pretend that you guys were having a big block party, right? Neighborhood block party or graduation party, something like that, right? You can invite a bunch of people to come to your house and you can get, let's say, 100 people inside that fence, right? Now, you have a fence and there's a gate on that fence. Now, if you have people that come to your house and they are literally climbing over the, f f climbing over the fence, you will look at them strangely. Right? You say, why are you coming over the fence? You're going to hurt yourself. I know. There's like barbed wire. Why did you put barbed wire on here? Keep you out. Right? It's like, you could hurt yourself on that. I know. There's a gate. Please use the gate. It is open. You have an invitation. Come. You don't have an invitation. You can't come. Who are you? I don't know. We're party crashes. Everyone jokes about that. We don't want the party crashes. We don't know who you are. Right? But you can get like 100 people in your yard and have a fun time. Get your jumpy houses. Whatever you got to do. Right? And they're out there. It's great. Now, my yard, lots of mud animals. When we have a thing at our house, we always want good weather because I don't want them in my house. I'm kind of a clean freak, right? But if you come into my house, right, you can come in and I'll let you into my kitchen, right? This is the, I can get maybe, I don't know, I've got a fairly big kitchen. I can get probably 20 people pretty comfortably in my kitchen. But because you're in my kitchen, not all 100 people in my yard can come into my kitchen. In fact, if you come into my kitchen, if you came to my house and I bought all North Central over, it would probably be my staff. I'd say, you can go into the kitchen and get this. We're out of this. Go get that. Right? I let certain people that I know who I've got a better relationship with go into the kitchen. Now, if I go into my kitchen and see you in there, and then I go in and I go into my living room, and someone's got their feet on my sofa in my living room, we're going to have issues. One, why are you in my living room? Why aren't you in the kitchen? In fact, why are you even in the kitchen? You should be outside. That's where the party is, right? If you go into my bedroom, my wife will kill you, right? <laughs> That's just the way it is in our house, right? Because my bedroom is my bedroom, right? And it's, it's a place which is different. And you notice how I set my thing up. I got a kitchen. I got a dining room. It's pretty easy to kind of fluctuate between those. But if you want to go to my living room, where you can really kick back and hang out and stay beyond the time you're supposed to stay, you can go in the living room. And from the living room, you can get to the bedroom, right? And if you remember growing up, maybe your best friend could go into the bedroom, or you'd send your best friend to go get your hairbrush or whatever. It's in my room. You know where it is. You've been there. But not everybody knows that because that's a space reserved for few. These are boundaries. <laughs> and yet in our personal lives, we have no delineation between where people are. We just have one big yard, and they all kind of just come on in or don't come on in, and we don't know how to do it. We don't have any doors. We don't have any gates. Often we don't even have a fence, right? And if we do have a fence, people seem to just climb over it. Like, you should take down that fence. That's dangerous. That's like keeping us all out. Uh-huh. That's, that's the point. Why are you here? <laughs> well, it took me like five. I would have been here sooner, but your fence, you got your gate up there, and it was locked when I came. Like there was a sign that said, stay out. I don't know who that was for, but you should keep them. It's dangerous around here. There are people around here. They do not want the best for you. It's a good thing I'm here, right? What's in your fridge, right? Because Seinfeld is, of all things, great. Can I have someone flip that? Lindsay, you want to grab that light over there? This is some of the best boundary examples that I think of. Just like that. <laughs> Boy, he's a weird guy, isn't he? Hey, hey. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Well, what are you doing? Yeah, Elaine, she has to leave her armoire on the street all night. I'm gonna guard it for her. You know, I need something to sit on. I want to sit on one of your cushions. Yeah, but this is so nice and thick. <laughs> You really going to town with that turkey there? Oh, yeah. I got a big appetite. Oh, Jerry, you got no mustard, It's huh? on the door. What, this yellow stuff? No, I said mustard, Jerry. Dijon. That's No. That's Bush League. Oh. Hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. What, are you just going to leave it there? It's like half a pound of turkey. No, no, I can't eat that. You can't eat a sandwich without Dijon. Yeah, you're right. I really should keep more of your favorites on hand. Hey, hey, hey. I'm getting a vibe here. What, are you unhappy with our arrangement? 
What arrangement? Well, I was under the impression that I could take anything I wanted from your fridge and you could take whatever you want from mine. Yeah, well, let me know when you get something in there and I will. Boundaries. Kareem is great, right? In fact, when I was finding those clips, I had this one of just all his entrances. Just six minutes of him sliding in the door and doing all the stuff. I'm like, he is the epitome of the boundary violator, right? It's great. But what are boundaries? And sometimes when we think of boundaries, we think in the negative. We're going to talk about this as negative things. But boundaries are about growth. Okay? Keep that in mind. Boundaries are about growth, and boundaries are not negative. Right? We have this idea of boundaries and negative. But I'm going to give a boundary definition, probably one of the greatest books out there, and I use this because I, I do think it's one of the best definitions, but I think it's readily available on most shelves of folks, is, the, is from the book Boundaries by Cloud and Townsend. And basically the boundary is described as where one thing ends and another thing begins. Where one thing ends and another thing begins. My skin is a boundary because it's where my inside ends and the world outside of me starts, right? Uh, we have personal boundaries, right? And we've all probably done those experiences where you keep walking towards each other until you feel weird, right? Um, we, we have different boundaries within ourselves depending on what we bring to the equation and what, what is comfortable, okay? And, and our background and experience of the boundary violations or the, the safety around it, we have different tolerance levels of being able to have certain boundaries and certain not. Okay, so it's where one thing ends and another thing begins. But what are they really? Okay, so that's a nice definition. But what are they really? What are boundaries really? So I put up a few things that I just went through to kind of spell this out. Boundaries protect us, and we know that, right? They are there for our protection. To ensure that we are productive, right? Sometimes we don't think of boundaries that way, but they actually improve our productivity because we know where we're supposed to go. Um, I don't, when I mow, so I'm going to keep using my property because I have a big property, right? When I mow, I mow about an acre, an acre and a half, right? On my riding mower. It's great. Okay, I just stick my headphones on to drive around the backyard. It's awesome. But I could mow like five acres if I wanted to, but I don't own the other five acres because I have a boundary line. So I don't have to, so I know what I got to do. And I know how much time it takes me to do that because this is the boundary that I work within. And so I can figure out if I got to do it after church or before church or whatever. Those boundaries help me be more productive, right? And they give me a sense of confidence in that. Uh, they provide a sense of control. A big process to setting boundaries, or those that don't have boundaries, is because we feel out of control. It's, it's crazy how overwhelmed we might feel at this time of the year. With school and all the demands and people need this and I've got to be doing that and I've got to do this and I have to do this and all this is happening and I feel overwhelmed and I don't know what to do and I'll say you don't have boundaries. What do you mean I don't have boundaries? It's like if you have boundaries you can compartmentalize things and begin to break down and manage those, right? So providing this sense of control is really important and when we don't have control we will find ways to enforce boundaries, good or bad. The best way to do that boundary is we write a list, right? Who do, who's a list maker? I'm not a list maker, right? Who are the list makers that do stuff and then write it down and then cross it off, even though it's already done, right? It accomplishes, right? Oh, yeah, that's good. I done that and that and that, right? But that just gives us a sense of control. Like, I'm doing stuff. This is a boundary so I can demonstrate that I'm being productive, right? And when I can't demonstrate it or when I can't show it or I've got no measure for it, it creates a sense of anxiety because it doesn't feel safe. So we do have control. It provides structure in the same way. It helps us to stay safe. We've talked about that. It also keeps us healthy. You might say, how does it keep us healthy? Because if you can't find structure, and if you can't find a place to do this, then you're not as productive in your time. You don't spend time looking after yourself. You don't maximize what you have. And then pretty soon you burn out. And there's lots of things we give up. How many people have skipped lunch or dinner because they got an assignment to do? Right? It's like, yeah. But who gave up, you know, 
And the part of it was because I watched the Netflix for like, you know, three hours. I was doing that, right? And I wasn't able to set any limits there. So now I'm giving up my meal because I've got to write the paper. And so what suffered in the end was my health, right? Because I didn't really have some, some good boundaries in place. So it's, there's lots of things that we lose in, in, in our health. They also provide us with information. Boundaries are really key. It tells you where one thing begins and another thing ends. It tells you where your property line is. And if we're not reading that information and we violate it, then we can get in, get in trouble. And then I wrote on the bottom there, they have both a positive and negative connotation. Sometimes when we hear boundaries, it depends. Well, let me back that up. I think sometimes it depends on where you are as a person in relationship to the boundary as to whether it's good or bad. Okay? So in our castle here, right, these guys inside, boundaries are good, right? I've got a castle, I've got a door, I've got my moat. We're well fortified. This is excellent, excellent use of boundaries. Now these guys out here would beg to differ, right? <laughs> Those on the other side of it, they hate your boundaries. Your boundaries are selfish. Your boundaries are self-seeking. You don't care about me. All you care about is yourself and your own survival, right? Thanks for nothing. Your boundaries are the worst ever. In fact, you're not even very good at them. If you invite me inside, I will show you how to set up better boundaries with me inside them, right? So boundaries are always about perspective. So they're good if, you, if they help you. They're bad if they're keeping you out. <gasps> Why would you want to keep me out? That's so sad. I want to be a part of your life, right? So they have good and bad connotations. One thing that is true about boundaries, though, they are always a choice when it comes to our personal relationship boundaries, right? And in some ways, you'd say, I could maybe say they are always a choice. Or you say, well, what about your skin? You don't get to choose that. That's just there. I beg to differ because I have a knife here, which I don't really have, but I have a knife here, and I can fix this boundary issue if I wanted to. It would also go against my health issue that we just talked about, right? But we can, we can choose to violate boundaries. There is a boundary. You can't come in here. Oh, well, I beg to differ. When we did, when we did Super Bowl stuff, remember we were doing all this stuff about having these IDs? It's like, I don't need your stupid ID. I'm going to come anyway. Well, our National God said, I beg to differ, <laughs> right? Um, in fact, I got an email. I got a text during that time of two people trying to get in. Right, photo from security, do you know who these people are because they don't have authorization and they're swiping the cards trying to get in? And I roll my eyes. I'm like, surely there is nobody left who didn't get the memo that we're closed for 10 days, right? They didn't get in. They couldn't come in, right? But it was a choice. They were still going to try to get in. That was just their choice, right? Boundaries are always choices. To decide upon a boundary will always bring an awareness to the fact that we cannot control or have everything that we want. And that's, that's, that's the scary thing when we so desperately want to be in control. I was thinking about this and preparing, and I haven't shared this before, but um, I'm not even sure if theologically it's correct. I'll throw it out there anyway. Because I, what's the first sin in the Bible, right? Well, when it, Eve ate the fruit. Or was it when there was a boundary violation? Because God set up these boundaries for our safety and our protection and all of these things. And, and she made a choice. And I chose to go over your boundary. And when I chose to do that, because I wanted to be in control, because I wanted to have everything, because I wanted it to be my way, and I did it, and there was a consequence. And then we were like, oh, why did this happen? Right? So gravity works that way, too, right? You jump off a cliff, the choice is made, right? So boundaries are always a choice. Now, here's something that I often share. I don't know if you remember. I, I've actually found very few people who know this. So maybe it's just a cultural thing in Australia. But in Australia, when I was little, we did, we did our uh, Sunday school. We learned this acronym, and it was called JOY. And it stood for Jesus, Others, Yourself. I don't know if anybody else learned that, but that's, that's what I learned. Oh, good. One other person. Good. But you're, not, you're from South Africa. No, where are you from? Ireland. Ireland. See? She's not even from here, so then that doesn't count. You know, I was like, wait, you're not from here. I know that. You told me. And I'm like, hey, we have a common thing. Yeah, it's British. Maybe it's a British thing. I don't know. But uh, joy, 
Jesus, others, yourself. And whether you learn that acronym or not, I think we all learned it in a sense. And, and what happens, what I like to point out is, even Jesus had boundaries. Jesus got in a boat and pushed away from the shore because everyone was trying to crush him, right? Jesus said to the disciples, go away from me, you're annoying me. I mean, he didn't say that. He said, why don't you go on to Galilee, right? Because I'm sick of your whining and your talking and I'll catch up, right? Then they all almost drown, right? He has to come out and save him again. It's like, oh, man, right? He had, there, there were boundaries, right? Jesus was sleeping in the boat while the boat's about to sink, right? I always think that's a strange thing, and Jesus never came. I don't, my Jesus didn't come up and just say, peace be still, right? My Jesus was ticked because he just got woken up. And he knows, you say I'm the Messiah, you think the Messiah is going down in a boat? That's not going to make a very good story, is it? It's like, no, he's like, guys, you're so limited. It's like, shut up. And he yelled, and then he said, now I'm going back to bed, right? <laughs> Don't wake me up. I need my sleep. It's very important, right? That Jesus had these boundaries. Jesus had boundaries even within his disciples. He had the 12, but those weren't his only disciples. I mean, this guy's got people following him everywhere. But he just had 12 that he selected, which means number 13, 14, 15 didn't make the cut, right? And they probably just were hanging out in the crowd all the time, all right? And then within that, he had his three. And then within that, he had Peter. It's always Peter. He always picked Peter for everything. I don't know if you notice that. Peter walks on the water. I'm going to build my church on you. You know, Peter's this, Peter that, Peter this. Why does he pick Peter's boat? He's going to brag about it for weeks. You know, it's always Peter, right? But he had his kind of one. That was just how he had his system structured. As we learn to live our life, though, as Christians, a lot of the times we don't pay enough attention to managing ourselves because we live in this Jesus, others, yourself. If I actually set a boundary for myself at the exclusion of someone else, am I really honoring Jesus? Am I really looking out for others? So I always put myself last. When you're little, you are egocentric. The world revolves around you until you're about 25. I mean, until you're about six, right? And um, so the world revolves around you, like everything. Cake, I'm going to have it. It's my cake. And so, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's ask if someone else wants the cake. I don't want to ask if someone else wants the cake, because they probably do, and, it, and, it's, and it's my cake. It's, it's my birthday. You can't have my cake, right? Yeah, but we need to ask. What would Jesus do? I don't know. I don't care. It's my cake. Right? So we have to train that. We get really good at that to the point now that we're adults and we hopefully are not as egocentric. But the fact of the matter is that we have to look out for ourselves and set boundaries for ourselves in order that we can minister, in order that we can give to others. Because we can't, as we've heard before, pour out to others if there's nothing to pour out in the first place. You're no good to anyone dead. Right? That just doesn't work. But there are going to be limits to that, which sometimes, again, pushes up against our anxiety that I can't control everything and I can't have it my way, and I'm limited, which is so annoying, isn't it? Limitations. i got to sleep. I need to sleep when I'm dead. Why would I want to sleep for? I'm missing out on this stuff, right? So there's this question in having boundaries. As you get older and as you work into it, you have to learn how to grow, because boundaries are about growth, into setting effective boundaries for yourself. And it does not make you an, a non-disciple, but it does not make you a sinner. It does not make you any of these things. It actually makes you a healthy person so that you can be more productive, so that you can have more to offer, so that you can be there when needed, right? So here are some examples that I threw up there of boundaries. Creating a study plan and sticking to it. That's a boundary, right? Some people have this weird idea that are you good at setting boundaries and it's like implied that it means can I say yes or no? That's what you're asking me. All right? I'm good at setting boundaries. I can say no. <laughs> it's like, but your boundary no is like that flimsy boundary of the, the castle thing where you just, no. Well, what are you doing at that youth group thing? Well, you see, they needed someone. And I know I said no. And I know I said I wouldn't do this. But it was really needed. And so now I'm there. It's like, that's a weird boundary. But I did say no, but I'm still here anyway. Okay, I'm not following, but you must be good at setting boundaries. Creating a study plan and sticking to it is a boundary. Why? Because when somebody comes in to ask you, do you want to come out, and you say no, because I have this plan, right? Then you stick to it, and you'd be more productive. I have, and you can get this in the student success center as well. Um, when I was growing up, 
I had a study plan, and it wasn't like do math on Mondays at this time. It was just homework. This was a chunk I had for homework. And in, in, in Australia, if you wanted to do well and go to university, in year 11 and 12, you were doing a minimum of three hours of homework per night after your eight hours at school. That was just how it worked. I came to America, it was a uh, snooze fest, right? Because it was so easy. Oh, you only go to class for like two hours, and then you go back, and then what do you do? Homework. Which is why I said last week, I didn't do homework on the weekends. On, uh, I didn't do homework on Sundays, and I didn't do homework after 10 o'clock at night. I just didn't need to, because I just structured my time in there. But I had this system that I'd learned in high school about how to manage my time. And, and in that time management, it wasn't about doing homework, uh, doing certain homework. It was about doing homework. And then I had gold time, I call it, which is tradable. So if I had something I wanted to do, I could trade that time. But I had to trade it. Right? So if I had youth group that night, I would need to trade that. And so there was a system that I had in place, and it made me more productive, it's, and, and it was better. But that meant when someone asked me, do you want to do this, I had to size that up against my, well, I have to get this done. So I, I kid you not, there were times where I'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning because I wanted to do something that night, and that was my homework block, but gold time is tradable time on the day. It's always on the day. So I had tradable time, and when I'm sleeping, that's gold time. Gold time is my time. That's all gold time means. It's the most valuable time out there, mine, right? I get up at 5 o'clock and I do two hours of homework so that I could go shoot hoops because someone said we were going to have this pickup game or whatever. I'm like, what am I going to do? I got to get up. I have to do something to get that in because that, that was my boundary. I had to have my three hours in or I wasn't allowed to play. So, you know, closing your door or finding a place to study that's uninterrupted, there's a boundary. Right? Sometimes you've got to close your door. Some people have the hardest time closing your door. Sometimes your door looks like your phone. Strange little apparatus of a door this is. It's amazing how quickly it opens and closes. And right? How do I put it away? How do I shut it off? How do I turn it off? Right? We're having that education with my 12-year-old. She has a phone. Now her, she's slowly getting the creep factor. As her friends all collect phones and the group texts start going out, it's starting to get later and later. Someone's on spring break right now. She goes, someone texted me at 1.30 in the morning telling me they got to Michigan. And I'm like, honey, let's have a little phone education right now. You have to turn your phone off because people have clueless on their own boundaries. I'm up, aren't you? No, I am now, right? Turn off your phone while studying. Turn off your phone while talking to a friend, right? Always check that you're talking to the friend and not talking to them via your phone, which I wrote that down, because I had this problem. I was talking to my friend the other day, thinking that we're having a conversation, but it was all over text. So I have to always clarify that this is actually a face-to-face -face conversation, right? But turn it off when you're having those, or when you're sleeping. Setting physical boundaries in romantic relationships, right? You have to throw that one up there, because that's one of the things we deal with all the time, boundaries. And boundaries are always about protecting me, because this makes me feel safe, but it means the person on the outside feels gypped, right? <laughs> it's like, come on. Wah. So let me, let me give you a little synopsis on my boundary thing. Take it or leave it, because everybody from youth group all the way up, tell us where the limits are, tell us all that stuff. I always wanted those information. I like this example. Every time your relationship changes, if you're in a romantic, it changes, your level of intimacy goes up. Right? That's, that's, that's what I have. If you have a friend, you get to meet this guy, this girl, and you're friends and you're in groups, and then that day comes and you say, hey, you want to maybe uh, go out to Half Price Apps or something because I'm cheap and I don't have any money? You're like, sure. Like, just the two of us? Yeah, just the two of us. Okay, your level of intimacy just went up. Your relationship has just changed, right? Okay, so now you're doing something that you don't do normally with the others. You're doing that. You then start to, now you could say, let's just be friends. Why do you want to date? The only reason you officially want to become a couple or a date is so you can touch each other. Or because you want to set this scene of saying, we are different, right? I want to hold their hand. I want to put my arm around them, right? I want to kiss them, whatever it is. Because you can't do that with just regular people, right? Trust me, <laughs> don't do that with regular people, right? You all remember that consent thing we did at the beginning? Remember that? I showed that to my kids the other day, and they're 12 and 9, but they get it. I'm a therapist, so they get it real young, right? The one about, it's my body, right? And I mess with my body, and I do what I want. I love that thing, right? And it's like, you want to give me a hug? No, thanks. <laughs> and it's like, can we say that to Grandma? Shh. Yeah, now you can. You just quote the video, right? Yeah, this is my thing, right? But when you move in your relationships, there is this idea that we can do different things in our, the level of intimacy goes up. Now, 
Think about the, all of those phases and stages in a relationship. What are you going to do when you get engaged? Your level of intimacy is going to go up. So w what's that going to look like? And you need to figure out what that boundary is, right? So once you move from the yard, going back to our story, right, the group friends, and they invite you into the kitchen, right, then, then you can do stuff in the kitchen, right? You flick each other with a towel or something, right? Touching doesn't always have to be touch, touching. My, my dad grew up, it was, we had these rock, the, kind of like a snowball, right? So we call them bundies. And you have no idea what a bundy is, but a bundy is when you go to like a building site and there's a pile of sand and you can carve out like a bunch of sand that's not super hard, not like a rock, but that when you throw it, it will explode on someone. And we call them bundies, right? <laughs> I don't know why. It's a cultural thing, right? But you do this as kids and you <laughs> always threw it at the girl in the youth group you liked and it blew up, right? <laughs> what are you doing that? La, la, la. And my dad always like, he's, now it became, he's chucking a bundy. It's my way of touching you from a distance, right? That's just, that's how it is. Pull a ponytail. That's just how I'm trying to send a message that I want our relationship to change. You go into the kitchen. You get engaged. You go into the living room. You get married. You're going into the bedroom. If you bypass all of the rooms in your house and end up in the bedroom, you got problems, right? <laughs> Nothing is now sacred for the marriage. So work your way back in your houses of your relationships, right? What are you saving for each area? Because each time you change in your relationship, your boundaries, either by both of your definitions, will change or one of them is going to feel like it should change. And you need to be having those conversations and you need to be setting those. And it's like, guess what? If you let them in your house, the chances of them ending up in your bedroom go up dramatically. OK, it just does. Right. My big thing at the moment is walking out on a, I was walking out on a lake with my girls. We were on ice fishing. I'd never been ice fishing. I took my daughter out ice fishing. It's a boundary when there's a frozen lake, right? Because <laughs> you can walk on it. It's amazing. But she was super scared because she's heard all these stories of people falling through the ice and she's walking out there like we're going to die. I'm like, honey, it's fine. And <laughs> no! right, go out there. It's thick, right? And we had to go up and we had to look down the holes and, you know, it's thick. And we're drilling and she's getting panicking, you know, because we were drilling holes like like all around. It's just not right to be on a look. There's a car out here. We're not falling through the ice. She's like, okay. And I said to her, I said, but honey, the chances of us falling into a frozen lake went up exponentially the minute we left the shore. There was absolutely no way I was going to fall in to the lake standing in the parking lot. There's no water underneath me. It's just impossible. And if I walk out on that lake, even though the boundaries say it's all intact, and there's an F-150 sitting right over there, does not imply that this piece of ice, where I'm standing right here, may give way. And when I go in the ice, I can't say, but that truck never went in the ice, so now, Dad, you lied to me, right? Once you accept responsibility to get on that lake, the chances of falling in go up. Does that make sense, right? That's just boundaries, right? Once you decide and make the choice to cross a certain line, you have to kind of assume a lot of those things. And it's like, but I didn't want this. I didn't want to fall in the lake, Dad. I know. Well, we should have stayed in the parking lot. But we didn't. But now we're in there. Now we're wet. Right? Now we've got to get out. We're going to die. Right? So this is his thing. Once you do that. So these are boundaries all over the place. So that's enough. We won't stay too long on that. I can talk ages about relational boundaries. Not taking responsibility for someone else's actions or behaviors. Right? That's another boundary. I can't be responsible for your behavior all the time. As a, as a parent, I am charged to be responsible for my kids' behavior on a lot of levels. But there's coming a day where I can't be responsible for that, right? I have to let them do what they're going to do, and then I've got to help them figure out the consequences, potentially. But I can't always hold it. But a lot of the times we do that for our friends. We take on their responsibility. Going to bed at a reasonable time, that's a boundary, right? Limiting the care you can offer those who are in crisis, that's another boundary, right? Making priorities and sticking to them. Not letting others take you on a guilt trip. You know, some people are like trip advisors, right? They're always taking you on a guilt trip, right? They tell you where it is. You're like, here it comes. Here comes my, uh, my travel agent getting ready to book me another guilt trip, right? You haven't been home in the last three days. When are you coming home? You don't like us anymore. You don't love us anymore. You're too busy for us, right? Oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to tell them. I love them, but I, I don't know what's going on, right? Understanding that a power differential and appropriate engagement. Sometimes in our relationships, so you're, 
you're working in different areas here at North Central, but you're also working maybe at your church. And then you, you're a youth person and you like the youth, right? But you've got to understand that you're as a power differential there. You're older, you're a sponsor, whatever you want to call them, youth person, right? I'm a boss, right? So there's always a power differential, right? And we need to be aware of what the appropriate steps are for that relationship. That we can't just be all things to all people. They shift and change. When my wife, uh, who's now a partner at her CPA firm, we used to do a bunch of stuff, and we, we were on the softball league with her team, with her work. And I said to her one day, why, why don't we all get to play co-ed softball? That was kind of fun. She goes, because I'm kind of like their boss now. They need to just be able to go and do their thing and not have me there because it's weird. I'm like, but it's fun for me. <laughs> it's like, sorry, right? Because it just changes and we need to be aware of those. Those are, those are important parts of boundaries. So here's College of the Overwhelmed, right? These are boundaries that you need to work on. Sleep, diet, and exercise, right? Things you need to att attend to. Those are important. Self-care is a boundary. Seeing more than no, we already talked to that. Boundaries need to be value-driven. The other thing I wanted to say is limits are not synonymous with childish behavior. Okay? I'm going to set some limits on you. What are you, like five? I don't do limits. Right? No, no, no. No, the, this, this, is a, this is a car. And the limit says 55. And you go 80, you get a ticket. It's not about being a kid. It's about a limit that's set. But sometimes when we say, are you able to set limits? Can you function under limits? It's like, I do whatever I want, thank you very much, right? Limits are not synonymous with childish behavior. One of the things you hear me say over and over again, when you're a child, you are a dependent. And when you get to a point where you keep saying, stop treating me like I'm a child, right? Because I don't want to be a dependent, then I have to be the opposite of dependent, and the opposite of a child is an adult. I want to be an adult, so if a child is dependent, adult must be independent, which is wrong. Adults are interdependent. We understand how to function because when we work together as adults, I don't question whether I'm an adult anymore. We're just doing stuff together, right? If you really think about it, children are the most independent creatures out there. It's all about me. It's what I want to do. It's how I want to do. And no, no, do it this way. I don't want to curfew. you. I don't want to put my phone away. I want to text everybody in the world until midnight. You know, it's like quit being so independent, <laughs> right? Let's try and being interdependent here. What do we need? What are we doing, right? Health, health, physical, spiritual, relational. When one of these things gets taxed, that equals stress. Now, we're going to do some Todd talks later on anxiety. Don't think that anxiety is just about, like, uh, mental health anxiety or, you know, clinical anxiety. We'll talk some about that, but we're going to do some stuff on anxiety specific. And then the last one, which is on the 17th, not the 19th, the 17th, it's a Tuesday, right? We're going to actually bring in a biofeedback machine. It's a computer program, and I'm going to teach you some stuff about using biofeedback as a way of how to calm and regulate the physiology that happens when we're under stress. But these are things that happen if we don't have boundaries. All right, last illustration, and then we're going to be done. Okay, so there's a, there's a process out, out there. Uh, which I like to use, and I don't have a, I don't have a nice little diagram, a uh, nice little slide for it, so I'm going to draw it on here. Then um, this process of the world collapsing and caving in on us. Now, if I, I gotta pull these people out of here. I'm going to move this so that I can, ah, let's use this one. So we use that little girl here, doesn't have to be a girl, can be a boy but I can't get him out of there. All right. So you ever seen one of these? These are fun, right? It's a problem when you like toys too much. You go into toys that, <gasps> ooh, look. Internal versus external locus of control in toy form. Let's see if I can sit that on there. All right. Now, here's this lady in there, if you can see that, right? She's the little scared lady. And she's got this ball around her. And, and she's got this pose, ah, as if this ball is like, Closing in on her like this. Right? See, everyone's really engaged. You make sound effects. Everyone's like, whoa, is she okay? Is she all right in there? Right? Now, this is what our world can be like. This is, this is kind of this boundary, right? Our biosphere, if it were a world. Okay? And, and it's out there. 
And, and you know this stuff happening, but this is kind of my school and my family and, and whatever it is. And I feel like a lot of the times that it's closing in on me. And sometimes it does close in, and sometimes it's like things tap on this, right? And they just tap, 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 and then it's like, oh, and it falls over. I didn't do anything. It wasn't me. Remember like when you're a sibling? I'm not touching them. It's like, you are. You're in my sphere. Okay? Now, this girl in here, this lady, or whether it be a guy, it's like it's a scary feeling because the world is caving in. Now, if we were to change this and put... Put our Athena person in there. Come on, Athena, stand up. Let's see if I can get it now. All right. Now that image, if you can see it from where you are, is a very different image, right? You've got a person in there who's like, oh, I can't do anything about it, right? And then you've got this warrior in there that's like, I want to see you try and move this thing. I'm going to beat it, right? And keep it back. Keep it out there. I used to draw this diagram. And it would look like this. Okay, so here's my person. And I would draw this bubble. And I would ask, which bubble, if you can see that, which one would you rather be? Now, the answer is this one, because we don't have time to have you talk about it, right? So the answer is this one. Some people are like, that looks so warm and snuggly. I'd like to be in that one. And I know this is the answer right here. This one, lots of room, okay, in my space. And if I were to say, how do you get that bubble to be like this bubble? Right? It's because there's pressure that comes in from the outside. right? And that's what makes that bubble look like that. So if that's true, then how does that bubble stay the way it stays? Does anyone know physics-wise? Pushing from the inside. right? You've got to have an equal and opposite pressure coming this way. Now, there is a name for this, and it's called internal versus external locus of control. And you may have heard this story before. It was pushed into kind of pop culture with a guy called Viktor Frankl and his book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he was in a concentration camp, and he was trying to figure out why some people died and some people didn't. And the ones that died were those that felt like there's nothing we can do to fix this, so we might as well give up. And others said, no matter what you do to me, you can't take away who I am inside. There's a great Bible verse that we know is greater who is he who is within me than he who is within the world. But this boundary thing is this ability to like, can I push back to create this space so I can function in it versus this external locus of control that's trying to crush me. And so one of the things that I would do with people is I would send them home with a homework assignment and I would ask them, what are the things that you're pushing back? Not being mean, not being that, but it's like setting these limits so that I can actually breathe, so that I can actually function. Because the world feels like it's closing in on me, and I need to have something to kind of push back. So, hopefully that's helpful for you. We're out of time. Next week, or ne yeah, next week, it's uh, being the balance. If you've ever come to my balancing thing for a freshman breakout deal with the relational guys that you move along, it'll all be about relationships next week. Um, so if you need some dating advice, come to that. Uh, if you've got friends, invite them to come, and uh, thanks for being here today. Take care.